Hello friends, this is Seher from Easy Beasy and the topic that we are going to discuss today is called as what are monosaccharides. Monosaccharides are monomers of polysaccharides. So they are the simplest sugar atom that we know of. Monosaccharides can be classified themselves further into two categories. One is on the basis of number of carbon atoms present in them and the second one is on the basis of functional unit. Now number of carbon atom means that if we have three carbon atoms in a saccharide we will call it triose. If we have four carbon they will be called as tetrose. Five carbon atoms will be called as pentose and six carbon atoms will be called as hexose similarly. If we talk about functional group, we have two different categories in them. One is the aldos having a functional group of CHO in them and the second one is ketos and this have the CO group in them. So right now we have two hexose here. One is the aldohexose and one is the ketohexose. In both of the cases, we have six carbon atoms. That is why they are called as hexos in both situations. But in this category, we have a functional group that is aldose here. And on the other side, we have the functional group that is the ketose here. That's why this molecule will be called as aldohexose and this molecule will be called as ketohexose. Now, other than these two categories, monosaccharides can be also categorized with common names here. For example, this three carbon aldotriose is also called as glyceraldehyde. Now, why it is called as glyceraldehyde? Because this word comes from the combination of glycerine with aldehyde. The second category is aldotetrose. This compound is also called as erythrose because it gives a red hue in the presence of alkali metals. Similarly, this aldopendose is called as arabinose. Now this name is related with the discovery of this compound as it was first discovered in Arabic gum. This aldohexose is also called as glucose which is commonly present in the honey and sweets. And the last example that we are going to take under this category is ketohexose. This compound is also called as fructose as it is usually present within the fruits. Now, if we compare glucose molecule with fructose, they both have six carbon atoms in them and their molecular formula are also same. Only the arrangement or bonding of atoms are different in these two compounds. So these type of compounds are called as isomers. Now isomers have two different categories there. One is the constitutional isomers and one is the stereoisomers. Constitutional isomer means that they have different bonding constitutions or different functional groups in them. And the example we just saw in the last slide was the difference between glucose and fructose. In both of the molecules, we have same molecular formula, but different functional groups in them. That's why their physical and chemical properties are also different. The second category is stereoisomers. In stereoisomers, their molecular formula and their functional groups are same. The only difference is that that the bonded atoms are oriented differently in space. Let's take an example of a hand. If we move this hand in different positions in a three-dimensional space, it will remain as a hand but it can make different configurations there. So this hand is showing a perfect example of stereoisomerism. Stereoisomers can further divide themselves into two different categories. One is called as enantiomers and the other one is called as diastereomers. 
Enantiomers are those compounds that can be a mirror image of each other. Just like in this example, we can see that we have a D-glucose and we have an L-glucose. These two glucose are still glucose, but their orientation is different in the space. And they are the exact mirror images of each other. That is why it comes under the category of enantiomers. That's why most of their physical and chemical properties are same. The only properties that are different there are the optical properties. On the other hand, diastereomers are the same compound with same functional group and same number of carbon atoms in them. But they are not mirror images of each other. That's why they have similar but not identical chemical properties in them. Their physical properties are also different. Now the question is, how many stereoisomers can a molecule have? The answer to this question depends upon the number of chiral centers present in a molecule. Now what is a chiral center? Chiral center is basically a carbon atom that have four different substituents attached with them. So for example, we have aldotriose. In this compound, we have this carbon that is attached with four different substituents. And we can twist the molecule at this position as well. Now to find out the number of stereoisomers, there is a Wendt-Hoff's rule. Wendt-Hoff's rule states that the number of stereoisomers depends upon 2 raised to power n, where n is the number of chiral centers. So in this compound, n is equal to 1. So this compound should have at least 2 stereoisomers. And these stereoisomers are D and L glyceraldehyde. And they are mirror images of each other, so they will fall under the category of enantiomers. Now, let's take another example. So this time, we are going to take a hexose. Now, in this aldohexose, we have one, two, three, four chiral centers. By this way, n is equal to 4. So the total number of stereoisomers made by this aldohexose should be around 16. And that is the case. So we have allose, altrose, glucose, mannose, gulose, idose, galactose, and tallose. All these molecules are the same aldohexose but they are not mirror images of each other. So they will fall under the category of diastereomers. And all these eight molecules have their own mirror images as well. So this d allose will have l allose. This d altrose will also have an l altrose. So in total, there will be 16 stereoisomers. Okay. Now, in monosaccharides, the compound with four or more carbon atoms usually convert themselves into cyclic or ring structures. That is because the functional group of carbon number one can react with hydroxyl group at the distal end. So this D-glucose can look like a hexagon. Now at this point, it can convert into two different type of cyclic structures. One will be called as alpha-D-glucose and the other will be called as beta-D-glucose. The only difference is the hydroxyl group that is present on carbon number one. If they are present just like the hydroxyl group arranged in carbon number two, then this compound will be called as alpha-D-glucose. And if it is oriented differently than the hydroxyl group present on carbon number 2, then this will be called as beta-D-glucose. Similarly, the D-fructose molecule can also become a cyclic structure 
and can convert itself into alpha D fructose and beta D fructose. And the only difference is the orientation of hydroxyl group present on carbon number two. With respect to the hydroxyl group present on carbon number one. Now, we also need to understand the concept of reducing sugars. Reducing sugars are basically those sugars that gives a brick red precipitate in the Benedict test. Well, it's nothing else. It's actually the cupric ion present in the solution that converts itself into cuprous oxide, which is represented by brick red precipitates. Now, all the monomers that we discussed up till now will perform this reaction and gives brick red precipitate in the Benetech test. So, all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Now, the question is, what makes them reducing sugar? The answer to this question lies in the hemiacetyl group available on each monosaccharide. Now, the question is, what is hemiacetyl? Hemiacetyls are those carbon atoms that are attached to hydroxyl group at one end and OR group on the other end. And it is in equilibrium with aldehyde or ketone. So in monosaccharides, we do have hemiacetyl group in every molecule. That is why all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you like it, please subscribe this channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.